Welcome to Chapter 3 for Physics 125 at GRCC. We are going to start talking about some background information that's going to look a little bit more like math than physics for this particular lecture video, but it's something that we need to be able to be comfortable with so that we can then add to our physics understanding later in the chapter. And to start out with, we actually have to introduce a little bit of trigonometry. Now, trigonometry is not a required prerequisite course for this class. And if you've never seen this before, that's perfectly fine. Everything that you're going to need fits onto this slide and the next one. We're going to see it used over and over. And we don't need to get any deeper than what we're going to see here on the slide. So first of all, one of the common mnemonics, if you have taken a trigonometry course, you've probably heard this, is called Soka Toa. And it's there to help us remind ourselves, although we never have to memorize um, reference material in this class, we will always have access to equations and, um, and tools like this on quizzes and homework and tests. But for this mnemonic, it's to help us kind of have it at the forefront of our minds that if we have a triangle with an angle, and the angle is going to be labeled with theta in this class, it's a Greek letter theta, looks like a zero with a line through it, we can figure out what the sine, cosine, and tangent of that angle um, is using the sides of that triangle. Now, the sine of theta is the opposite side, the farthest away side, over the hypotenuse. Hypotenuse is the word for the longest side. And so in this drawing with color coding and labels, it would be the length of side A divided by the length of side C, the longest side. For cosine, we care about the adjacent neighboring next to side over the hypotenuse. So that would be B over C in this labeled triangle. And the tangent is going to be the opposite side, A, over the adjacent side, B. Okay, so all of this you would be able to look back at whenever you need it, and we're going to see how this actually plays a role in our um, physics in this chapter and beyond. And we also can look at this secondary triangle that I've drawn, where we've labeled the hypotenuse with the letter C, again, just as before, and now we can kind of put in, instead of an unknown A or B length of sides, we can actually use the sine and cosine equivalents and do a tiny bit of algebra to rewrite that the opposite side would be the hypotenuse times sine of theta, and that the adjacent side would be the hypotenuse times the cosine of theta. The reason it's rewritten like this is because this is the most common way we're going to be applying those sine and cosine relationships is that we know what the hypotenuse length is and we are trying to find the lengths of the remaining two sides. The other thing worth noting, whether it's the labeling from the previous picture or this one, there's the Pythagorean theorem, which is another key piece of trigonometry we'll be using, which is a squared plus b squared equals c squared, where c is always, always, always the longest of the three sides. Now, for the Pythagorean theorem, we don't have to memorize it, and we'll see how it is used. Um, but again, it is something that we have to understand when we're applying it and why we would be using it. So these two introductory trigonometry slides are to make sure that we're all on the same page, whether or not we've seen trigonometry in a class before. And all of the rest of the chapter, we'll be seeing how these tools can be applied. Now, if we think back to chapter two, chapter two was kinematics in one dimension. Chapter three is now kinematics in two dimensions. We're gonna see how things get a little bit more complicated using the same underlying concepts once we're thinking in two dimensions. The idea of displacement back in chapter two was a change in position. We care about where we were at the end compared to where we were at the beginning of a motion. In this chapter, it is still the same general idea, and it's still a vector, which we introduced the idea of vectors in chapter two. But now we have to be careful about how we specify what direction it's pointing and how long it is in the horizontal direction and the vertical direction. 
there's this word on our slide called components. And a component of a vector is basically the x piece or the y piece. And we'll be seeing that over and over in this chapter and beyond. So let's think about what this two-dimensional idea means. This might be an introductory question that we would see that's part of a larger physics problem later on. We're told that we have moved or some object has moved 10 miles in a direction that is 50 degrees north of due east. First of all, that phrasing, that word phrasing of a direction is also drawn here on the picture. North of due east means if we face east, we have to swing that amount north in order to see it. The more of these kind of word descriptions of directions we see, the easier it will be to understand them, but we do need to recognize that that is a separate skill we have to be able to do. We are not going to get situations in our everyday lives where we have a drawing every single time we're trying to figure something out. We might be told in words the situation and have to figure out what those words mean. So in this question, we're trying to find the distances east and north that we could travel to basically end up at the same spot of this um, displacement vector. So what we want to do is draw a triangle that the sides of the triangle would have arrowheads and they start in the exact same spot that we started and they end in the exact same spot that we ended but they're gonna look like this. There is an arrow that points to the right or east and an arrow that points up or north. The lengths of those sides then are using the trigonometry we've just introduced. If the hypotenuse is 10 miles, because that's the original length of the vector, then we can apply that the adjacent side, which in this particular case is the horizontal X piece, the adjacent side always means cosine, that's not always going to be x, but it will always be adjacent to cosine. And the opposite side, in this case the y component, although that's not always the case, will be using the sine idea. So 10 cosine 50 degrees means we have to go 6.43 miles east. And then 10 sine 50 degrees means we also have to go 7.66 miles north. So the length of the displacement vector is the hypotenuse of a triangle that we can draw even if there's no triangle originally on our page. We can create a triangle with a perfectly flat piece and a perfectly up and down piece. We then decide where our angle is, and again we're going to be using the Greek letter theta to therefore define what the opposite side or sine component and the adjacent side or cosine component is. Absolutely what we need to recognize is that opposite and sine are always going to be um, linked together and that adjacent and cosine are always going to be linked together, but we should never ever just assume that one of those means X and one of those means Y because we will see lots and lots of dis different situations where it's basically half and half which one's X and which one's Y and it's the situation that tells us which is which. So for example here, this particular situation, we have a 15 mile long vector pointed 35 degrees east of south. It means we face south and then swing east by 35 degrees. I want you to pause the video and try to get the east and south components on your own, identify which one is sine and which one is cosine before you start playing the video again. Okay, so in this case, the adjacent side, the next to side, the cosine side, is the vertical component. It's the um, y component uses cosine this time. Because it points downwards, and down is our typical negative direction in the kinematics portion of our course, we are going to give it a negative sign. So it's negative 12.3 miles or 12.3 miles south. And then we go to the east, and because it's far away from the angle, the opposite side, we're going to be using sine. And so 15 sine of 35 degrees is 8.6 miles. Now, 
the calculators that we're using for this course really should have sine, cosine, and tangent buttons on them. We don't need to have a deeper understanding of these trigonomic, trigonometric functions, but we do need to be able to use them on our calculator. We will also be seeing in a couple of slides that there are inverse buttons too, inverse cosine, inverse tangent, um, inverse sine. We're going to be thinking about those two eventually. Okay. Throughout the entire course, from this chapter onward, we will be dealing with vectors pointing at strange angles that need us to be always using these um, sine and cosine ideas. So an example from chapter four, the next chapter in line that we'll see next week, we might have some ropes attached to a wall and there's a 55 degree angle between the rope and the wall and that 50 pound tension force will have to be broken into a horizontal component and a vertical component to be able to solve the situation. That's the kind of thing we're going to have to be doing all of the time is breaking an angled vector into its X and Y components. Now, in terms of adding vectors together, that's going to be one of the most um, key and possibly most difficult skills that we're building in this particular chapter. We will initially think about them graphically. The textbook does as well. But I do need us to understand that at some point we have to be using the quantitative methods that we're going to be seeing. It means we're going to have to be using the trigonometric functions that we introduced at the start of this video. Now, if I want to add vector A and B together, whether I'm thinking of this in a quantitative way or whether I'm thinking about it in a visual way, functionally what we are doing when we're adding vectors together is we're saying those might be two separate trips, but what if one person walked all along vector A and then also walked all along vector B? We get what's called the head to tail method where we take one and we place it end to end. So the head of the first vector is where the tail of the second vector goes. And really important, we are not making a circle of arrows. We are saying once we have all of the smaller pieces head to tail, they are telling us where we started and where we ended. And so our final ultimate vector points from the very start to the very end. Kind of like if you are comparing somebody walking or hiking all of these different paths with someone who's got a toy helicopter and can just go the straight shortest distance from the start to the finish. We will see this over and over, but we do want to recognize this head to tail method and the arrow directions are extremely, extremely important for us to understand. So the head to tail method is really key for drawing out vectors and we always want to draw arrows if we are drawing vectors because that's what makes them special. Vectors have direction and that direction matters. But we do need to recognize the limitations of the graphical methods introduced by our textbook and other sources we still have to calculate a number value at the end of our situation. And this method doesn't really do that unless we have really clear graph paper. And that's not the kind of situation we're going to see ourselves in. We're going to have to figure out how to do this with a quantitative method. So we'll have a whole separate video that really focuses on vector addition in the quantitative way. But I do want us to at least end this video thinking a little bit deeper about vector components. When we have vectors at weird angles, we want to break them up into y pieces and x pieces. That means we're going to be drawing a lot of triangles. We'll be using this idea of trigonometry quite often. But this idea of making x pieces and y pieces that's what we mean by vector components. We actually already know how to deal with adding vector components together from our work in chapter two. Let's say, for example, we only have a couple of X components, horizontal components. If we hike seven miles west, and then we turn around and we hike 10 miles east, 
when we ask for our total displacement vector, which sounds very um, physics, math kind of question, we're really just asking where are we now compared to where we started. And if we draw a picture or if we think about west and east as having different um, signs, plus and minus signs, we can recognize fairly quickly that we are now three miles east of our starting point. That would be our total displacement vector. Let's say that we had our car, we did all these hikes, and now we want to know where are we compared to our car. We are three miles east. We can do this also if we have a mix of components that are horizontal and components that are vertical. And again, drawing it out is really going to help us. So let's say that we have four vectors here. These are each trips. Maybe we are um, driving each of these trips and we want to figure out how far away we are from where we started so that our friend with a little toy helicopter can come and find us. The first trip we take is 20 miles east. The second trip we take is 15 miles north. The third trip we take is 30 miles west. And the fourth trip that we take is 12 miles north. This is where if we already have only side to side and up and down pieces, the head to tail method is extremely useful. We can draw these out relatively to scale. It is always going to be really important for us to draw these relatively to scale. And this, this um, head of the first vector is the tail of the second one because we're physically there as we do the next leg of our journey. Once we draw all of these out, we can kind of visually see by eye where our starting point was and where our ending point is. The total vector is just a single arrow that points from the very start to the very end kind of like comparing these as one person taking the long way and somebody else with a helicopter taking the short way. If we draw that short way as a single arrow from the start to the end, that is the total displacement vector. Sometimes it's called the sum vector, sometimes it's called the resultant vector. If we wanted to figure out how long that new red arrow is, the magnitude or size of the total displacement, we have to think about the addition of components as simply being if things point opposite each other, we take one of those numbers minus the other. If things point in the same direction as each other, we just add those numbers together. It will look fairly obvious to us if we've drawn it out on our page. So because we went 20 miles in one direction and 30 miles opposite, we would take 30 minus 20, and the side to side piece, which points to the left here, is 10 miles long. And because we went 15 miles north and 12 miles north, those add together, and now we are much farther north than we were at the start, 27 miles instead. If we wanted to get the length then, we would use the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus B squared equals C squared, where the length that we care about is that hypotenuse C. So 10 squared plus 27 squared gives us our hypotenuse squared value. And when we solve for C then, by taking the square root of both sides, we get 28.8 miles. And that's how far away we are as the helicopter flies. All right. So we're going to end this introductory video here so that if you need to come back and um, really make sure that your foundational understanding is solid, you've got a shorter video to watch. The next video is going to get into a lot more detail on how we actually handle vector addition from the very start of the situation to the very end of it. So I will see you in that next video.